Building out a local regenerative food system takes a lot of different pieces, and the very, very beginning of that is our farmers. So I wanted to visit with Weston Walker, who is an expert in genetics when it comes to the grass-fed, grass-finished cattle that we need for this truly regenerative system. So I wanted Weston to tell us a lot more about what he does and how we can learn from farmers, and especially on the cattle side. All right, Weston, uh, really excited to be visiting with you. Heard you on my buddy Jared Lumen's uh, Herd Quitter podcast and uh, thought, hey, this guy is a, an educator just four hours north of me. I want to learn more about the agriculture, the regenerative. I love how you threw in the science behind the fescue and the genetics on the cattle. And so, brother, I just wanted to sit down and visit and see what kind of wisdom we can share uh, with, uh, you know, up and coming farmers or maybe farmers that want to shift a little bit as well as all kinds of life lessons. So thanks for joining. Well, thank you, Logan. I think uh, it's really, I've got to watch some of your podcasts since then, and I really appreciate that, that you're trying to put forth and, and uh, that you're trying to do uh, uh, holistic uh, systems and, and, uh, trying to do things a more natural way or sure something that's been near and dear to my heart uh, for several years. I love that. Now, I can't wait to jump into your perspective. So to start, if you don't care, can you can you tell me a little bit about Kit Pharaoh or the Pharaoh Cattle Company and how, how you're connected in all that? Because I think that's going to be, in your world, everybody knows, right? But uh, in, in mine, maybe very few do. Um, well... Uh, yeah, Pharaoh Cattle Company uh, was started by Kit Pharaoh about mid-1980s, and uh, he was uh, doing just like a lot of us uh, in agriculture, uh, going with the mantra that's been taught since probably World War II that bigger is better and, and more production is uh, more maximizing production uh, is, is what you need to do to be profitable. Um, when in reality, uh, he was seeing, because he's a smart individual, he really started seeing that he was going to go broke um, uh, doing that, and profitability was not tied to maximum production. Uh, I recall the very first ag economics course I took uh, uh, when they talked about the law of diminishing returns, and they really promoted the concept that you should uh, put one more unit of in just to get that extra bushel of corn, as long as uh, that extra bushel of corn covered the price of that nitrogen. Well, uh, the, there's a lot of hidden cost, and I, I was trying to think of things as we as we talk, or as I was thinking about this interview, and I thought, you know, the more, and it's I found that it's an Albert Einstein quote: the the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, and uh, you know. Too many times we're listening to talking heads, if you will, um, and having been through the university system and whatnot, I, I understand that uh, research is only going to get funded uh, if there's something to sell at the end. And so uh, if we kind of are trying to go nature's way and the way the good Lord made it, we're probably not going to have to put ourselves in the middle of uh, this operation as much as, uh, as we like to think we do. And that's where man's pride kind of comes into it. But, um, back to kit, finding profitability was not tied to maximum production. Um, and so, uh, started looking for what really matters on the ranch. And, uh, that's a, a moderate cow that can do it. I mean, when I say do it, she can produce a calf every year, uh, that we maybe 50% of her body weight is a goal. Uh, and do it uh, every year for a lot of years and uh, try to do it on a low input uh, process. Now, <clears throat> if everything was free range like it used to be back when God made this country and we were settling it, and, uh, or we could just, cows could go wherever they wanted to to get their mineral and water and shade, whatever, they could go where the good groceries were. But uh, unfortunately, we lock them into a certain area and so we may have to provide some inputs because the land that we have management of, stewardship of, may not uh, have all the 
necessary nutrients that we need for those animals. So I'm not opposed to bringing in whatever we need, but just remember that you're going to make more money if you have more trucks hauling stuff off of your property than if you have trucks hauling inputs onto your property, fertilizer, feed, you know, whatever that may be in your vegetable. I love the simplicity of, of how you put that. Yeah. Um, so, so Kit's whole mantra is a uh, low input grass-based genetics that can, uh, uh, perform, uh, uh, profitably and, uh, let the cows work for you rather than you having to work for the cows. That's a pretty good summation. I think of his uh, Pharaoh cattle company. So Pharaoh, they, in, in your involvement, it is, it's more about the genetics that fit that criteria and the it, my understanding is it's uh, bulls. It's kind of like the the biggest impact for getting genetics is is going to be in in the bull that you use. So how how are are y'all meeting that demand, and how is that demand uh, going? Is it growing on the grass fed side? Yeah, and and so I've always uh, kind of tried to share the idea that. The, the bulls we produce, and there's about 25 cooperating producers across the United States from South Alabama to, uh, I guess the farthest would be some up in Montana, um, and from, uh, I guess, some Minnesota down to uh, uh, Texas. So we're, we're scattered all across the nation, and uh, uh, the, the, the philosophies apply wherever you're at. But... What I've always tried to say is we are in the mama cow making business. I mean, the bulls we produce uh, are going to be the kind of bulls that will make you uh, uh, give you the opportunity to retain females that will be the kind of long lived, easy doing type cows. Uh, so that then, you know, if you want to hit a terminal market with a, uh, you know, put a big growthy type of a conventional or, or a, continental breed of cattle on that then go to it but you need cows that can survive on low input and produce more than uh, with those big growthy bulls whereas if you were to have these big growthy cows well then it's costing you so much money you just you're not really profitable so it's trying to make the factory if you will low input and have a high output and that's what we're in the genetics we're doing. So yet the market is, is, is in grass fed type cattle. I mean, our cattle will do it on grass, but they'll also do it in feedlot. The problem is they're much more efficient converting the grain, uh, because they're good at converting the feed or the forage and, uh, they don't have to stay in a feedlot very long. And, uh, that segment of the market, uh, you know, is, is really ba getting paid for, uh, like a, a bed and breakfast. I mean, they're getting paid for the amount of feed they sell and the number of days that they're housing them, you know, so uh, they would prefer bigger animals. And, and there's some economy of scale there in processing, too. I mean, I've been in the grass fed direct marketing realm myself. And, and you know, when you've got a smaller carcass, well, then uh, you've still got the processing fees, uh, some flat rate processing fees. And so that that causes you some grief. When you're trying to spread that out over a bigger carcass, you know, it's a, uh, it's consideration. A person just has to know the, be aware of all the costs and be educated in what you're trying to accomplish. Well, so Weston, one of the aspects of all this that, uh, you know, trying to bring back in for everybody is through the sewing prosperity platform mission. It's like, I, I cannot break up health and agriculture because the food that we have is so connected to the optimization of health and how, how we feel and that how it's produced matters as much uh, based on nutrient density and all the, the you know, the, the downstream effects of how it's raised. So right. go into what you do specifically on, on the specifics of the animal, right? Like utilizing the cattle, uh, where, where is the advantage on the land for this a little smaller, more uh, tolerant conversion 
cattle versus say uh you know a lot of the the bigger breeds i think you use the term continental that's that's going to be the very large frame cattle right where where is the benefit of going this route long term say say for the land and for for food um point of clarification when i said continental breeds those would be those that came from france and and uh, Switzerland and so on, uh, those would be like your Charlet, your Simmental, some of those breeds. The British breeds, uh, uh, I, I forget where was a, an article at some point in the past said that the, uh, uh, you know, the even the Red Angus and Angus national herds of the United States have, they've been selecting bigger and bigger. So it's within every breed, there's some good. Um, but partly the reason they do a continental crossing uh, was for hybrid bigger because they're a little farther apart on the uh, genetic spectrum. So you get a little more heterosis in the cross. That's what I was referencing there. But they're big cattle in all breeds and right, good or bad, whichever way you want to fall on it. The purpose of a smaller, a smaller framed animal, uh, you know, really, if you want to be the most efficient, I think Joel Salatin, uh, I listened to a talk he did one time, you know, the most efficient uh, animal that can use forage uh, on a per acre basis is probably going to be a rabbit or a chicken. Um, so the smaller the package animal, the more you can actually produce on a per acre basis. Uh, sheep are more efficient. Uh, more, you could get more pounds of lamb off of an acre than you can pounds of beef. Uh, and so it's all because of smaller packages uh, you can produce more. So with that thought line, and, and you can just kind of relate it, that it's, a cow will eat basically 3% of her body weight in a dry matter per day. So now how are you going to feed that 3% of her body weight? Um, and you could argue and look at the feeds and feeding books and say, well, it's 2.5% at this stage of the life cycle. And, you know, if she's a heavy milker, she'd be 3.5%. Okay, but let's just hit three for easy math. And a thousand pound cow, which is, uh, my herd's gonna average 1100 probably on my cows, 11, 1150. And, uh, but let's just use a thousand pound for easy math because I've got a lot of younger animals that'll be there. Compared to a 1500 pound cow, 30 pounds of dry matter per day compared to 45 mat, uh, pounds of dry matter intake per day. Well, I can run three 1000 pound cows for the same groceries if you will, as two 1,500 pound cows. A lot of people are running 1,500 pound cows. Some are running much larger than that. Those cows require a lot more groceries throughout uh, their life. And they're not really, the research shows they, those bigger cows do not produce more pounds of beef uh, necessarily. Uh, we've got to look at in, or, uh, uh, production per acre uh, rather than so pounds of beef per acre rather than uh, pounds of beef per cow. Bigger cow might take four acres to produce that pound of, or that beef that offspring, where the smaller cow might get by with two, two and a half acres, you know. So it just, just depends on uh, what you're looking at, but it's all about that smaller package, uh, more efficient, the engine, you can get into the fact of uh, all the difference between, a, I think of it as a, single phase power compared to three phase you know it takes a lot more energy uh bringing in for for bigger lines a bigger power for a bigger engine to operate more equipped well that bigger animal has a bigger engine basically so she's got to have more energy intake just to maintain herself not only that but then add on it to the production so one thing that i i really trying to get get across is is the community building side of agriculture depending on how it's done i feel like uh so we went down to bluffton georgia and filmed with white oak pastures and will harris a, a documentary and in that it showed how what will and his family and crew are doing are creating is sowing prosperity right in in bluffton georgia mm -hmm. and through through the regenerative agriculture, through utilizing uh, the multi-species raising, create, you know, Will put his own processing facility in there, put his own mm -hmm. general store in there, put his own restaurant in there, and provided jobs and housing 
and things are growing there. Whereas when we travel across Arkansas, uh, we we've seen the exact opposite. Like my hometown, it, it's agriculture left. It's not doing real real good. Uh, Eastern Arkansas, the River Valleys, uh, Southern Arkansas, they're not doing good. How in in your experience do we build out this this local? Uh, food system kind of to support support itself so there in you know south central missouri where you are how how do you see strengthening your home area with the food system um so i guess it was probably in 2012 uh maybe 20 2000 maybe in 2006 2008 actually uh there was a thousand gardens project going in Springfield that we were, I, don't, I wouldn't say I was in any of the ground laying works of that, but was at some meetings and some things like that. And, and they really talked about a food desert, you know, that we're, we're in a food desert. We, we, too many counties do not, cannot produce, do not currently, let's say it that way, do not currently produce enough food to feed their populace. Um, and so there was kind of a push uh, even that far back and to try and make it to where you could. So uh, on our own, uh, uh, in our own operation, we kind of look at uh, being able to be more sustainable. And I've had multi-species operation, uh, goats and sheep and pasture raised non-GMO Berkshire pork. And, you know, we, we direct marketed and, and, uh, you know, just uh, family chickens and, garden and all those things so i've seen all the realms of that and uh and i believe that the biggest thing is knowledge uh, trying to acquire the skill sets and the knowledge and the resources um i I don't think we need to worry about doom and gloom and 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 be thinking about oh well we're gonna we're gonna survive some apocalypse here or something like that and the well, just because we just, so what if you had all this stuff stored back and so on, if they want it, they're going to come take it. So you better put your trust in a higher power that's uh, going to uh, protect you uh, a lot better than, than you're going to be able to protect yourself. So, but, but I do believe the good Lord gave us a mind to reason with and, uh, and to be, to think through some things. And I don't think he intends on us just to be uh, sticking our head in the sand and, and not being prepared for uh, you know an ice storm that occurred back in what was that 2011 or you know that a tornado that's going to knock out power for so you, you need to have some some things in place and and there's a skill set that our great grandparents did every day from canning and putting up their own food and all these things and so I think if we can. Uh, and that's something I, I've worked a lot with the plain community when I was doing soil consulting and, and seed sales and, and uh, some different things like that in years past. And, and I got a lot of respect for them to uh, try and try and be self-reliant and not dependent on the outside world. And, and, you know, when we had that ice storm in 11, I don't know if they had it down your far south or not, but wow, you know, 11 days with no power and, and uh, middle of the winter and ice and all that. And so, uh, the, but I went and saw some of the plain community. They didn't, didn't even phase them hardly, you know? Uh, and, uh, there were people in Springfield that were out of food. They didn't have anything in the cupboards. I mean, they were going to neighbors begging for food and that's just silly that you're not any more prepared uh, thinking ahead any better than that. But that's the instant gratification society we're in. So I do think that this knowledge, gaining knowledge, skill sets of how to how to keep a garden, how to keep your soil balanced and, and natural composting and uh, uh, running some small livestock, you know, uh, just for your own sustainability. And I mean, there's no way that all the cattle we've got are able to, uh, that we'd ever be able to eat them. You know, we've got to have an outlet source. And so uh, uh, that's not it's not just for food production, but it's food production for others. So you kind of need to think about the networking side of things. How are you going to sustain a community? Uh, you need to be, you're going to need your neighbors if things 
you know, fall down. And, uh, and so you need to be working with them and being, and, and not everyone's going to agree with you on the way you want to operate, but you still, if you're trying to do what's right, they'll come around, you know, just keep spreading the good word. That's all I know. I, I love it. With, um, with the food desert and, and stuff, one of the things that I have become increasingly frustrated with is uh, the the conflict on what uh, healthy is and what food is, and kind of almost like the war on meat and the war on cattle. Um, and and one thing that where I come from, Weston, on on this is the cancer world. Cancer is my absolute passion. With you know my baby having cancer. And so I, I tend to disagree with mainstream on just about everything when it comes to that. And recently interviewed who I believe to be the, the foremost expert on cancer metabolism, uh, Dr. Thomas Seafried out of Boston College. And Seafried has been a proponent of the ketogenic meat-heavy diet along with uh, some, some other things that probably not the, the talk for, <laughs> for that. But my point of saying is... We've got to have this quality meat that builds our local food system. Like, and, and we need to eat more meat. So the food deserts, part of that food desert issue is that they're eating trash, right? They're eating absolute processed junk filled with toxins that's causing them to be sick. So not only are they living in somewhere that doesn't have access to the production of food, they're eating trash, and now we are having to bring in from other places. So like people like you are absolute heroes and uh, I'm hoping that you know the takeaway here is like we've got to support y'all because if you don't raise the food and we don't have the local processors to package it and distribute it we we're going to be in a bad place and we've got to eat meat and the whole demonization of of it is is nonsense right oh (laughs) we could have all kinds of conversations about different realms of this because I've studied out several different things and one of the most recent eating for your blood type uh, is something we kind of uh, looked at and, and, and thought about. And, you know, it's hard to had to do a special test to just figure that out. Um, but uh, my wife is uh, is an A blood type, and I'm an O. Well, O's supposed to have been the hunter gatherers, and you know, from Scotch and Wales and Germany, and, you know, and all up in France. And so uh, uh, I, I get along a lot better on the no carb high protein deal but my wife she's an a and that's more the mediterranean you know she got a little italian blood and some stuff well she gets along a little better less meat you know chicken and so on she's not really supposed to eat a lot of beef so but she feels a lot better when she's kind of following those things you know i mean she loves tomatoes and grew a bunch of them this year but I love them and I get to eat them and she's not really supposed to because of inflammation, you know, just so everybody's bodies, it makes a lot of sense that we're all, well, none of us are exactly the same. So I, I wouldn't say that there's a only going to, you know, be, uh, be one way for everybody. That's, I don't think that's probably a, a fair assessment, but I do think that you know, everything we know, well, we know from the word that, that it was perfect in the garden and, then you know things got screwed up whenever they didn't do what they're supposed to well i believe that the battle right there from the beginning what the enemy been working on is pride well man gets to thinking he's got a better way a simpler way an easier way um through the lies and so that's what has come about since well i mean i don't know how far you've ever gone into some of this but william albrecht is is a soil scientist from University of Missouri back there and before the World War II, if I remember right. And I followed a lot of his uh, natural balance and stuff uh, at times. And and I, uh, you know, uh, my understanding is that World War II, you know, we didn't have ammonium nitrate uh, until after World War II, whenever they were spreading it on the land to try and get rid of it. And they noticed they saw an increase in green up of plants. Well, hey, we've got a lot of We've got all this system in place for making this uh, as a byproduct of the ammunition manufacturing. Well, what are we going to do now? And uh, so that's where that came from. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that you could probably say a lot of the chemicals that we use, you know, herbicides and so on, were because of war. And uh, and so these, but it's always this law of unintended consequences. That's the, 
they, I know that there's a lot of people in agriculture, and, and, and I can say that I believed that mantra too when I was young. And, you know, we're trying to feed the world, you know, and whatever we can do to, to make that's uh, a noble thing. And it is, but if we're not careful, we'll, that law of unintended consequences, we'll end up with something bad going on. And what do they say? Uh, the United States has got the, cheapest food system uh, in the world, but we've also got the highest medical expenses in the world. Um, so yeah. you can yeah, lay there's those costs somewhere. Yeah. There's, yeah, you, you know, them. Weston, that that goes back to what I was what I was getting at with the whole the feed the world mentality that that's kind of what got us into this this uh, issue, this health crisis mm -hmm. that we are absolutely mm -hmm. in. It's bigger, better, faster, more efficient factory style linear thinking whereas right. uh if we all focused on feeding our communities right and and teaching that and replicating it and having these localized regenerative food systems yeah. we do feed the world right yes. by, by 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 proxy by just everybody doing it themselves instead mm -hmm. of one person trying to feed the world it's not right. going to work um no. brother thank you i think there's there's a lot of uh you know things that we could go on and on <laughs> with but uh, yeah. supporting our local farmers, supporting our local processors, our, our local markets, I think mm -hmm. is going to have, have the positive uh, unintended consequences uh, long term. Yeah, and I think whether it's looking at soil fertility, you know, uh, in a pasture scenario or in your gardens or whatever, but trying to figure out how to do things more like they used to be before we could go buy it out of a bottle or a bag. Um, and, and trying to do things, uh, sometimes less is more. And if we can try and study, and that's when I was talking about the knowledge thing, study out those old, what the old path, if you will, you know, and, and neglect not, uh, uh, those things. And, 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 uh, I, I really believe that we should be trying to, uh, uh well, I, I've said it like this, whether it's Gabe Brown and, you know, Joel Salatin, Kit Faro, Ian Michelinus, Greg Judy, uh, uh, what other names you want to throw into all this that you've probably had some podcasts or heard these names. I, I relate it kind of like this. They're all singing from the same hymnal, church reference here, uh, but some of them are on different songs. Some of them are on the same song and different verses of the same song. And if you're not careful, you'll hear what everybody's saying, and it sounds like noise and confusion. And so, well, that's not what's meant to be. But if you can drill down and listen to the message of each of them, find the common thread, well, our Lord and Savior's uh, the, the message in all of those. And, uh, and when you get to that point, then you can say, oh, yeah, there's a piece of this. There's a tool over here I can use, and there's a tool over here. And whenever I start looking in my toolbox for what's going on right now, then I've got the tool to, to apply. Just don't think that you can only go one way or the other, and it's the same thing. I use old oh, Doug Peterson's methodology for stockpile grazing in the winter, and then uh, and I'll go do Jim Garish's uh, quick, uh, hat, you know, kind of a, take half leave half you know deal and then i'll start but as the grass keeps growing i start slowing down you know i think kit payroll probably summates grazing as good as anything and that's to put the most numbers of animals possible on the smallest area possible for the shortest period of time possible and that will replicate your you know herds the wild ungulate herds grazing and moving on and, and then give lots of rest period because the Lord made this whole thing where it works without man's intervention. So let's get back, try and take self out of it. Quit trying to manage for what we don't want and manage for what we do want. And uh, I think we can simplify our lives a lot. You know, I mean, the salt program that we're using, I, uh, man, I, Gerald Fry is a name you might be familiar with, you know, different ones and, and minerals. And I've studied out books and this and tried to, and and I've tried every gamut of it um, and some good programs, but just nothing ever really fit. And this one we're using Steve Campbell's, uh, the one that's got some videos on it. And uh, that's really not, he wasn't the one that originally came up with, but just sea salt, baking, natural baking soda, you know, uh, 
and uh, Redmond's conditioner and, and some molasses to entice them. Lord willing, I mean, knock on wood, we've been having the best health for now 18 months, two years almost on our cattle, just going simple. And it's, it's, they're better off. Um, and so I know that trying to get self out of the way, manage, learn, study, and be a good observer uh, is the way to produce. And that's locally, in whatever facet you're in. And then like you're saying, share the word with your neighbors. I mean, uh, look, look at those markets. And, you know, ultimately, we're still a consumer-driven market in the U.S. for a little while. I don't know how long. But, but uh, I do think that, you know, we can vote with our dollars. And, and, yeah, it'll cost us more probably locally, but we may spend less on our medical bills and going to the doctor if we're eating more healthy. Absolutely. Man, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before, before we wrap up, tell us where we can uh, find, find you and how we can support, uh, you know, what, what y'all are doing, especially for farmers looking for maybe some of those, uh, those stud genetics y'all got going on. <laughs> well, uh, Pharaoh Cattle Company dot, or let's see, it's PharaohCattle.com is the website um, you can find. And, and under the Cooperate Producers, I'd be listed under that um i uh, i'm actually been working on setting up a speaking tour down into the southeast uh kit pharaoh and i during labor day week of labor day is going to be in uh, waynesboro georgia dothan alabama uh loosedale mississippi vidalia louisiana and then over to cameron texas uh on the saturday september 9th to evaluate our heat tolerant bulls that we've been producing uh down in, to, to have a sale in November in uh, uh, Leadahatchee, Alabama. And uh, so, you know, you can sign up for Kit's news, uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, newsletters, e emails and such. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think just uh, trying to uh, trying to educate yourself in, uh, in, in think outside the box and just don't listen to necessarily everybody. What's that old saying about following the money? Um, you can usually figure out well, if somebody's got a product to sell and when, and granted we do, we've got a product to sell of an animal that I think though is going to help the person's bottom line and, uh, uh, make more efficient cows. And, and that's why, that's why we're doing it. Feel like it's uh, the Lord's been a blessing on it. So we're thankful for his guidance on the matter. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate your time. Appreciate uh, you share, sharing your wisdom and uh, look forward to getting Arkansas added on that tour. I didn't, I didn't hear it in there. We're going to have to get you all to stop on y'all's way through. Well, Arkansas, we hit pretty hard. North Arkansas and the Ozarks portion of it, we're, you know, we, we've got a lot of customers. We've kind of been in there and done quite a bit. It's down in that Delta region that uh, I'm hoping, well, I've talked to some people that'll probably go to that Vidalia. That's be about a three hour drive for some of them. But um, yeah, we'll, we can only get kid away from the office so long. He He's ready to go to the cabin and go fishing, I think. So. I love it. Thank you, Weston. Thank you, Logan. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work. God bless. So that's a lot, a lot to unpack there, and I think that Weston did an amazing job of uh, not only living it and practicing it, but uh, explaining a lot of the things that they've got going on with the Feral Cattle Company and all of the other producers in, in this uh, collaboration that they've got. What we do with the Sowing Prosperity Institute is break down and dive deeper into more of those things. Uh, so you can join the Sowing Prosperity uh, Institute. We will break down the full lessons, add a lot more detail to what's, what uh, it means when when he talks about different things like the, the continental or the grass-fed versus, uh, you know, imported beef, just different different aspects that go into the regenerative local food systems, the health, the nutrition. You know, we're going to continue to uh, interview titans like uh, Gabe Brown and Sally Fallon Morrell, uh, Jordan Rubin, to, to name a few of the incredible guests that we've had on the Sewing Prosperity podcast and break down their lessons because we're always learning, trying to take in some of the wisdom. I think Weston brought up a great point in 
we got to learn. We got to educate. We got to just maybe not believe everything we hear and understand that cause and effect. So join the Sewing Prosperity Institute, and we're going to continue to learn together. Thank you for listening to the Sewing Prosperity Podcast. We hope that you have learned something new and that you are inspired to adopt regenerative practices in your community. Remember that by working together, we can create a sustainable and abundant future for ourselves and for future generations.